it is a fabulous scavenger hunt about very powerful stuff. I mean, that combination is, uh, is really irresistible. These people exist at, these, at universities of, you know, at, at Harvard and Yale and places, like Princeton. He's, a, he's just as though they're physicists who talk about quantum mechanics. Langdon is this symbiologist who will go by and knows what three marks on a cave wall represent and what it meant then and how it was interpreted down through the, through the centuries since. Angels and Demons is, is uh, I liken it, to, it's, it's a horse race, and it's loaded with subtext. I mean, Langdon himself enters into the beginning of this with a huge agenda already vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the Vatican um, and everything, and, and the organization of the church with a great knowledge of what the, what the rituals are. There's a much more of an unspoken communication that goes on throughout Angels and Demons. At the same time, there is a very, very specific race that is going on. I mean, it's, it's against the clock, and they have to figure this stuff out at the same time that they have to be there in time in order to try to stop it. It's wonderful to play somebody who is smart, that who is an expert in this very, very obtuse field, and is constantly collecting, you know, n the knowledge. But not only the knowledge, but the, also the interpretation of that, what that knowledge goes. You know, if he's, he's a symbologist, so he studies symbols, and he knows he is way ahead of anybody else when it comes to understanding all the permutations of what a signal means, a uh, symbol means. Uh, it means different things. It means different things throughout time. It represents also one symbol can represent five different, you know, divergent points of view. You are really getting into the the great path towards uh, enlightenment and uh, an understanding and a questioning of uh, of our universe that goes much much beyond the uh, the norms of obeying, you know, a church dogma or of a church status. So, by and large, it's all just one fabulous game of uh, of uh, trivial pursuit, but it's for Im important matters that they're pursuing. Ron, for all of his um, making it look easy or, or seeming not to take it too seriously, is actually more fearless now as a filmmaker and takes much greater risks than he did when there was much less at stake. It's not easy to make these types of movies. It is a huge kind of engineering feat that is required. You've got to go places, you've got to build things, but you also have to have a, you know, a, a vision for how to bust open a genre version of making this movie so that it becomes very personable and very, very palatable. Well, he's a symbologist. He's a guy that's fascinated by the, the constant solving of puzzles. It has always been that way. Uh, he has a, he has a, 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 a exchange with uh, Dr. Sienna Brooks, and he says, "Well, you you were a weird kid. Yeah, I was a weird kid too. I was always alone, and I was always thinking about stuff that no one ever bothered with. And because of that, he always has something to do. Uh, this is one of the reasons I love I love uh, uh, playing Dr. Professor Robert Langdon is um, because his mind is always seeing things that nobody else is. He's searching out patterns. Uh, he's searching out um, he he." He, like he, he'll, he'll see a symbol that he can go back through all of history and explain what it means and how it got to have that meaning and the, its import to society. Uh, so he's always the, sort of the smartest guy in the room. And he's also called upon in order to, to literally solve those problems that no one else can because they need the expertise of a professor of symbology. In the great uh, tradition of Sherlock Holmes, he's a guy who's living in a world of his own and is looking forward to the excitement, the game is afoot, so to speak, of, uh, of, a, of a quest or a treasure hunt or a scavenger hunt. That, that's really almost what the, these movies come off, the, you know, clue to clue, sight to sight, um, uh, all along the trail that will, will lead you to somewhere. Um, but there's always a mystery to be solved at the same time. And it's up to Dan Brown, quite frankly, in order to in order to make the maps for those trails, and he's, he's, he's able to do it. The great beginning of this movie is Robert Lang is in a, is in a hospital room being treated by uh, this, this, this young British doctor, and uh, it's, uh, he's there for, for literally out of consciousness, and a few minutes later he realizes that not only is he in a hospital room for reasons that he doesn't quite understand, but he's also in the city of Florence, Italy, for reasons that he has no idea of whatsoever. So even if you're just trying to find out why he's there, that alone is, the, that alone is a, an answer that uh, takes about two hours to, uh, uh, to come around to. Ron Howard is looking to cast it as interesting as possible, and there's, there's some archetypes that, are that, that, that Dan Brown hints at that can actually go any number of ways. 
it's not necessarily required to have an, uh, an actor like Omar C play, uh, play who he does. Uh, but uh, the international aspect of the setting, uh, as well as you know the the, uh, the environments of something like the World Health Organization, begs uh, uh, and allows uh, for uh, international actors of, uh, of of all stripes, all colors, all diversity. There, I mean, there is outside of Ben Foster, who it plays a you know an important but tertiary character in, in Inferno. I'm the only American, uh, and I'm, uh, there's only three men and uh, there's three women. So when it's a, a bunch of people of different colors and two, the two different genders that, are, that make the movie go. And I just think that, well, that's just the way, it, in all honesty, that's the way it should be. Well, Dan is great because he, he writes these things, so he does all the, you know, the true heavy lifting in order to come up with uh, the theme and the setting. The adaptation from book to screen is, it, look, it's a particular beast. It, it doesn't have an omnipotent uh, uh, narrator that, you know, of Dan Brown's voice, but it does have the specifics of the when and the where and the why. Uh, and it, it ends up being part of a months-long exercise uh, in which we're all involved in order to trying to discern what, what is, what's the most that we can cram visually and verbally into these, into these, into the screenplay and into the final movie. What I love about these things is that we we are in places like the Hall of the Five Hundred or the uh, Uffizi Gallery for a specific purpose. We're there in order to take in what is there. We're not just setting a, a fight or a headquarters or something like that in a in a groovy backdrop. We're there in order to study the masterpieces that are up on the wall and try to find a clue that is inside those very masterpieces. And guess what? Dan Brown has figured out that the clues actually sort of exist. Or at least there's a mystery there that, uh, that no one has been able to, uh, 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 to figure out the root of. And uh, that ends up being, I think, a, m the biggest secret out of all of, these, uh, out of all the films. It, the, the, the theme, of course, is fun to examine, and in this case, overpopulation. It's an important theme to take into account, and everybody can understand it. But I think the real pleasure that makes them as the popular films that they are is that it is a quest, it is a hunt, it is a, it is a mystery to be solved, and as the clue comes in, the whole audience is to go, I didn't know that. <laughs>